Uh, good evening and welcome to all of you for uh, joining us tonight for the uh, University of New Mexico's 60th annual research lecture. Uh, my name is Mike Dewar. I'm the Vice President for Research for the next 127 days and counting. We come together tonight to celebrate the honor and honor the significant achievements of this year's uh, lectureship recipient, Professor Carl Karlstrom of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. The annual research uh, lecture is a long-standing UNM tradition that brings the academic community together uh, each year to recognize the outstanding scholarly contributions of one of our faculty. The award is the highest honor that uh, the UNM faculty bestow upon a colleague in recognition of their research and creative works. I want to take uh, just a minute to thank the Research Policy uh, Committee, uh, chaired by uh, Professor David Hansen, for uh, conducting the process of selecting uh, the research lectureship. It is not an easy process, I can tell you. There's a lot of outstanding research going on in this campus by a lot of outstanding people, and making a selection of just one of them is a very, very difficult task. UNM places a very high value on its research and is proud of its Carnegie uh, designation as a very high research university. Last year, UNM faculty researchers generated about $100 million in extramural funding in support of its research mission. And that uh, level of funding is um, uh, uh, significant, but it's just one, of, uh, one measure of our faculty's research accomplishments. Equally as important is the uh, faculty's research contributions across all the academic disciplines, including the arts, the humanities, education, medicine, the sciences, and engineering. And it is critical to remember that much of the faculty's productivity and achievements in this regard are made working closely with the students that they mentor. Students are what we do at a research university. Education is research, and research is education. That's what distinguishes a research university. Speaking of students, uh, tonight we would like to begin by recognizing some of the students' outstanding research uh, accomplishments. The New Mexico Research Grant is one way that we recognize our outstanding emerging and young researchers. Uh, the grant was originally created to encourage UNM students to work uh, with state agencies on research projects that directly benefit uh, the state of New Mexico. We are pleased tonight to have uh, Brian Colon uh, this evening to present these awards. Uh, Mr. Colon is president of the board of directors of the UNM Alumni Association. He's an attorney in the Robles Rial, uh, Rial and Anaya Law Firm. He was instrumental in obtaining the, recruiting, uh, the recurring appropriation that provides the funds for these awards. Brian, you want to come up and uh, present these? You got the lavalier, I can't take this off, right? See, the AV guys at UNM just abhor every time they have to do an event with Brian Colon. Because I love to walk around the stage and get excited about what I'm talking about, and tonight's no different. I couldn't be more excited and privileged to, uh, than to be here with you tonight. Um, I've got an exciting and full evening, so this evening they've given me 35 minutes to visit with you a little bit about the history of the Graduate Research Development Grant and honor some of the students who received that grant this year. Um, and then following this event, I will be headed over to Hodgen Hall, our alumni center, our oldest building on campus, um, in order to put on what we call our Lobo Living Room, where we take the great work and the great things going on here at UNM and bring the public in to educate them about that work. So after my presentation, I'll be excusing myself to go over to Hodgen Hall, but I'll be very disappointed not to be able to enjoy the rest of the presentation. And uh, I know it's been some great work, and I want to start out by saying, um, Professor Karlstrom, you uh, have a phenomenal reputation here at the campus, and it's a very personal reputation. Uh, when I visit with my friends who have been in your program before, they clearly state that you are the professor who had the deepest impact on their work here at the university through this program that is on the wall over here. So thank you, and congratulations to you tonight for being the focused and keynote speaker. And I know this is an academic presentation, and I'm not used to academic presentations because I'm not much of an academician. In fact, if this was academic and I had to qualify by my GPA, I'm not sure that I would have been invited tonight. And I'm not sure if you're allowed to laugh at these events or if you're allowed to clap, but I want you to feel free to do so anytime in the next 35 minutes. 
This mic's working, right? All right, how about a round of applause for Carl? Huh? See, Professor, I knew that would warm the audience up. See, I got it. So let me start by saying, uh, uh, I will also let you know that when I talked to Dean Peasany before this event, he said, you've got 35 minutes and I've got five. And let me tell you, the professor I'm introducing is a hell of a lot more interesting than you. So if you can cut your program down and give me 10, that'd be better. Huh? And so I'll try and do that a little bit. But I think it's really important. And on behalf of GPSA, um, you should know that this is a program that's central to the mission of our organization here at the University of New Mexico. I had the honor and privilege of serving as president of the GPSA back in 1999 through the year 2001. I did two consecutive terms, and I had two agenda items during my terms as GPSA president. I wanted to ensure that we closed the loop and finally acquired recurring health insurance for GAs, TAs, and RAs at the graduate schools here at the University of New Mexico. And I'm pleased to tell you that we were able to do that with the help of a lot of folks, over a million dollars a year in recurring funds for that health insurance. That was item number one. And item number two was what we called the GRD fund. And I want to let you know that I'm very pleased to be able to say that uh, I had a phenomenal team of people around me. Uh, I often get credit for the GRD, but it wasn't just my show. Uh, I happened to be in the right place at the right time, surrounded by some incredible people. I had two GPSA chairs during my time as president of the GPSA, and one of them is here tonight. And uh, he took 10 years to get his PhD, which is nothing compared to the fact that it took me 10 years to get my bachelor's degree. I always said I was on the tenure track, and people said, that's fantastic. I said, no, 10-year track to get my bachelor's degree. But Dr. Carl, uh, I am so pleased you're here tonight because you were instrumental in helping this become a reality for graduate students here at the University of New Mexico. So Carl, if you'd stand up and be recognized, thank you for your work on this GRD grant as well. So let me go on and tell you who else I was surrounded with. Not just Dr. Carl Benedict, but let me just also tell you my chair that followed Carl was somebody that's very familiar to most New Mexicans by this time. He's this bald guy from Wagon Mound. He's one of my dearest friends. And we recruited him to run for GPSA chair, and he was incredibly helpful in getting this GRD established. And his name is our Honorable Attorney General, Hector Balderas. We also, at the time, had the ASUNM presidents working hand-in-hand -hand with GPSA, and the student body president that was most instrumental in helping set up this GRD was Eric Anaya, who's now practicing law in Colorado, the son of Steve Anaya, a tremendous family, a great history with the University of New Mexico, and a phenomenal family. So if you could help me also recognize Eric Anaya for his good work with ASUNM collaborating with GPSA. Finally, on the team that established this fund, which is now granted uh, um, probably over half a million dollars, I believe, um, at this point in graduate research development grants, um, was the student regent at the time, who really it's a disservice to call him a student regent because the good doctor and Carl and the folks out there that worked with this individual knew he was not just a student regent, but he's in fact a regent and a tremendous advocate for the University of New Mexico. His name was Jason Boselman. He's now a distinguished attorney here in the community, and uh, he did a great job helping us also advocate for the graduate research development. So please, a round of applause for Jason Boselman. <laughs> See, I know this isn't comfortable because you don't clap a lot at these academic things. Is that right? Are, are we OK? Huh? This is the audience participation time. See? Um, so let me tell you about our vision for the GRD. The GRD was an idea that we took up to Santa Fe and said, we have some phenomenal students at the University of New Mexico in the graduate programs in every division. But they're not able to do the work that impacts New Mexico and New Mexicans and the future health of our state because of lack of resources. It's very difficult as a sole researcher without a team of individuals supporting them to be able to get grant funding and to execute on the vision they have for their research. But if you can give us just a little bit of money and let me tell you, the first year was only $40,000. He said, if you give us this money, we will ensure that we'll be good stewards, that we'll grant it to graduate students whose work impacts the state of New Mexico and the health of New Mexicans for years to come. We will ensure that it impacts underrepresented populations, 
populations who are plagued by poverty, and frankly, rural New Mexico. These were our agenda items. These were our goals. When you're talking to representatives from San Miguel County or from Raton, they want to know that when they make these allocations to organizations to do research, that it's going to impact their small communities. That those research dollars are not just going to affect the I-25 corridor, but in fact going to impact all 33 counties of the state of New Mexico, particularly our rural population. And that's exactly what this program has done. There are so many fantastic grants that have been given, so much phenomenal work that's been done by UNM students to impact those very communities. And I couldn't be more pleased and honored to stand before you tonight than to highlight those grant recipients this year. So without further ado, I want to say that congratulations to the GPSA leadership, Texana Martin, who is the president, unable to be here tonight, Stephanie, who does a great job um, administering and being a, um, just the right-hand person when Texana's not around, and even when she is around, you always see Stephanie, she's doing the heavy lift. So how about a hand for Stephanie at GPSA doing a great job? <laughs> so this GRD money is really about investing in New Mexico, watching for outcomes, serving small communities, and collaboration. So those are the things I want you to think about when you hear about these recipients who went through a very competitive process to receive their grants tonight. So, that said, I'm going to start and ask Christina Abbasari to come on up and join me on the stage. This is where you can clap. Huh? And I'm going to read this because it's great. Certificate of Recognition from GPSA presented to Christina Abbasari as a distinguished recipient of the New Mexico Research Grant under high priorities on this 23rd day of April 2015, signed by Texana Martin, GPSA president. So congratulations, Christine. Now let me tell you about the important work that Christine is doing. Christine currently holds both an MA and an MS and is currently a doctoral student in the Department of Counselor Education. Her research is entitled, importantly, Counseling Professionals Conducting Suicide Risk Assessments for Youth in the State of New Mexico. I agree it's that important. You weren't, right? Let me tell you, this is serious stuff. Suicide in New Mexico is 2.5 times more prevalent than any other state in the union. So when we talk about GRD grants impacting communities and hitting to the heart of what's important to the future of our state, there are not too many things that rank up there with suicide prevention. How about a hand for Christine? <laughs> Christine's qualitative study will explore the lived experiences of counseling professionals conducting suicide risk assessments for youth K through 12, receiving a suicide risk assessment recommendation. The purpose of this study examines how counselors working as contractors for a school district experience and manage their stress or alternatively, opportunities for growth while encountering suicide in youth. In New Mexico, as we mentioned, suicide is reportedly 1.5 to 2.5, the national average according to the New Mexico Department of Health's 2010 st statistics. Counselors play a pivotal role in reducing this tragic epidemic. New Mexico communities can benefit by informed practices that better prepare counselors to perform suicide risk assessments for youth as well as their families to the best of their ability. Most importantly, this research aspires to assist counselors to allow them to be more meaningfully engaged in their endeavors, subsequently enhancing the human dignity of their clients and the communities they serve. So Christine, thank you for your work. It's critical and we're proud of your work. Thank you for all you do. Our next grant recipient is Moses Allen. And Moses is unable to be with us this evening, which means you don't have the whole certificate and the handshaking, so we'll cut down another 15 seconds there. Right, Carl? All this goes to Mark for your introduction, just so you know, okay? I'm yielding that 15 seconds to you. Christine, you're welcome to have a seat or stay up here with me. It's far more interesting if you're up here with me. I'm kind of shy, so I'm glad you're here. Moses Allen is in his second year of the Educational Linguistics Doctoral Program at UNM. 
He's a licensed teacher in New Mexico and has worked internationally as an English teacher in several foreign countries. His research project fosters collaboration between four programs involving language and literacy education. The language programs under his study and the area of study are as follows. Read West Incorporated, which is located right here in New Mexico, US of A, the Asoci Asociación Las Tías de León in Nicaragua, Colegio Americano de San Carlos Language School in Guaymas, Sonora, Mexico, and the Village Library supported by Libros para Pueblos in Oaxaca, Mexico. Each of these programs are being evaluated based on teaching materials and language activities utilized in the classroom. Each program will receive the complete report resulting from the research project. From the report, the individual programs will each be able to learn and take best practices from each other. The report will also provide feedback to facilitate critical reflection for the individual programs as they relate to the populations here in New Mexico. So again, Moses Allen, congratulations on your research grant. Let's give Moses a hand, even though Moses isn't here. See, next year we'll make attendance mandatory. Otherwise, we get to keep the money, huh? <laughs> or give it to Carl for some more good work, huh, Carl? The next recipient is Ana Maria Denalo. The good news about them not being here, I don't have to pronounce their names correctly, see? Right? Ana Maria is a native New Mexican and a Chicana scholar in the Language Literacy and Social Cultural Studies PhD program here at the University of New Mexico. She has taught health education curriculum since 2006 and volunteered within several Latino communities in New Mexico as well as Central America. Ana Maria has a long history of scholarship in the areas of community empowerment and emotional education. Ana currently works at the Center for Health Policy and the Center for Educational Policy Research at UNM where she specializes in qualitative methods of inquiry. On behalf of Abriendo Puertas, Opening Doors program, Ana is conducting research to support the natural leadership qualities inherent to families located in the South Valley of Albuquerque. The AP model uses a two-generation approach that increases the number of Latino children in the United States who enter school ready, willing, able, and most importantly, healthy. Approximately 500 parents have graduated from the program since 2008, and 140 new parents will be completing the program in fall of 2014. The Abriendo Puertas Opening Doors course is currently taught at 12 elementary schools in Albuquerque's South Valley, the West Side, and the very important International District. The majority of participating families are monolingual Spanish, Spanish-speaking uh, families, and first-generation immigrants. With the support from Partnership for Community Action and GPSA and this grant, Ana is currently investigating the program's impact on children's socioeconomic and socio-emotional development in relation to New Mexico's early learning standards. Through parent interviews and focus groups, the Abriendo Puertas organization and Ana Marie will continue to evaluate community action and awareness around the, in, around the information related to parent transformation and early childhood education. Let's give a hand to Ana Maria Denalo. Am I speaking too fast? Are we good? You're amazing. How about a hand for our interpreter tonight doing a great job? You know, I speak at 80 words a minute with Gus up to 120. Think about that, you'll laugh later. It's an old Zig Ziglar line. Anybody in the room know Zig Ziglar? Huh? Great guy. I stole that line from him. He won't mind, he's passed it along. Okay, our next recipient, Brian Hendrickson. Brian didn't show up either, huh? I'm telling you, we're taking... Oh, Brian, it's so good to see you. Come on down, you're the next contestant. How about a round of applause for Brian Hendrickson? Got one of these fancy certificates for Brian, too. He even spells his name correctly, B-R-I-A-N. Oh. One of these. Right on top, you had it exactly where it belonged. She's amazing. 
Brian Hendrickson, as a distinguished recipient of the New Mexico Research Grant as a high priority this 23rd day of April 2015, presented by Texana L. Martin, President of the Graduate and Professional Student Association. Congratulations. Let me tell you a little bit about Brian Hendrickson's important work. His dissertation is an ethnographic study of a student chapter of the International Nonprofit Humanitarian Engineering Organization, partnering with a local professional chapter working on water and solar projects on nearby reservations. Again, getting back to collaboration and underserved populations. You are right on point. I guess that's why you won. Congratulations, Bray. Good work. His work will also impact joint health and anthropology projects interested in improving water quality and sanitation in an isolated community in Bolivia. Brian is employing cultural historical activity theory and actor network theory to better understand the evolving ecology of this cross-disciplinary and cross-cultural experiential learning opportunity. And to develop a student-centered approach to designing and assessing courses and curricula that are all responsive interdisciplinary, vertically integrated, and writing intensive. Funding from GPSA's New Mexico Research Grant will cover the majority of this project's interview transcription ex expenses, and we couldn't be more pleased to do so. How about another round of applause for Brian Hendrickson and his good work? How about Amanda Jones? Do we have Amanda Jones in the audience? Oh, that's all right. 10% right off the top. <laughs> huh? Amanda Jones is a lifelong wildlife lover. She grew up in New Mexico and attended UNM, but ultimately got her Bachelor's of Science degree in biology from Wichita State University in Wichita, Kansas. Amanda's coming back, and her research is on mammals in the Gila region of New Mexico, including the famous Ted, Ter Ted Turner Ladder Ranch. With the Turner Foundation and this grant, she's been researching the effect of climate change on mammals with an emphasis on bats. Bats are economically important due to the fact they consume enormous amounts of insects and pollinate many plants, including agave. They are also one of the draws of New Mexico's most profitable tourist des destinations. At least this lady's listening. Huh? How about one of New Mexico's most popular tourist destinations, bats? Thank you very much. Bats are particularly at risk with project, uh, projected climate trends due to their communal roosting and low reproductive rate. Most species, most species of bats have only one young bat per year. Amanda's research uses old data available through museums such as the Museum of Southwest Biology at UNM in comparison and in contrast with new data that she's currently collecting to assess changes in species ranges, habitat affinity, and timing of mig migration and reproduction over the last 100 years. This information will be used to inform wildlife managers, such as the Turner Foundation, as to best practices for conservation of these important animals. How about a round of applause for Amanda Jones and her important work? Next up is Mr. Nandina. Come on up. How about a hand for Vizwanath Nandina? Vizwanath was going over his name with me before the event, and I said, look, names are important to me. When your name is Brian Colon, when they forget the accent, it's important to get it right. Huh? Right? And I've heard all the jokes, so don't try a new one on me tonight, OK? Vizwanath is doing amazing work, and I'm so glad he's here tonight. He is working as a research assistant and PhD candidate at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at UNM. He received his master's degree in computer engineering, and his research interest is in the area of cloud computing, in information security, and software-defined networking. He's been actively involved in the inform informatics group here at the University of New Mexico. Ms. Wanath has played a major role in the initiation, design, management, and development of the research projects 
that demonstrate the capability of the framework to address the challenges in information systems, cloud computing, and network security. The current system makes it possible to manage usage and information flow between virtual machines and a cloud-based network throughout the life cycle of the network and its resources. Ms. Wanath was instrumental in setting up the software-defined networking infrastructure for this very project. The project is currently in its second phase. He has also published peer-reviewed papers in internationally recognized conferences supported by organizations such as the Institution for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, as well as the Association for Computing Machinery. So, we are very excited about your work. I've got lots of issues with my iPhone, and maybe you can help me work those out afterwards. But we are pleased to give you this Graduate Research Development Grant. How about another hand for Mr. Nandina? And, like his colleagues, he is a distinguished recipient of the New Mexico Research Grant, high priority this 23rd day of April 2015. Thanks so much. How about another round for this million dollar smile, huh? Is Mandy with us tonight? She was threatening to show up. It was just that, a threat. She's not here. 10%. Dean Peasney, you get that 10%. All right, Mandy currently holds an MS and a doctoral candidate in clinical psychology. Her research is titled Brief Motivational Interventions for Individuals with Substance Use Disorders Being Released from Jail. Almost one half of all jail inmates meet criteria for a substance abuse disorder, and a third, a full one third of convicted jail inmates were intoxicated at the time of their offense. And yet there are no known efficacious treatments for inmates with substance abuse disorders, especially when they're being released from jail. When individuals with alcohol and other drug use disorders are released from jail, unfortunately, they often return to the environment from which they were released and those environments put them at a high risk for relapse on alcohol and drugs. And thus, and obviously, they're more likely to be rearrested and reincarcerated. Mandy Owen's study builds upon the existing empirical literature by testing a brief motivational intervention that could help to improve the post-incarceration outcomes of inmates who have sub substance abuse and substance use disorders who are being released from our Bernalillo County Metropolitan Detention Center. To date, 52 individuals have been consented into the study and recruitment is ongoing with both males and females. The findings from this study will be used to inform programming that the individuals with substance abuse and use disorders can receive when being released from the detention center. This study will help other jails around the country in providing hope of intervention and improving the lives of these men and women and reducing the rate of recidivism as well as their families and communities and enriching the homes to which they return. With that, we want to say congratulations and good luck to the work of Mandy Owens, who received this year's Graduate Research Development Grant. How about Joseph P. Sanchez? Don Jose, welcome. Do this first so the photographer can sit down and relax. This certificate of rec recognition is presented to Joseph Sanchez as a distinguished recipient of the New Mexico Research Grant High Priority this 23rd day of April 2015. Joseph P. Sanchez, thank you. You know, we've got lots of folks in the medical profession and the health services area with us tonight, our former dean and so many others. And I can't help but think about the interdisciplinary work that goes on from the healthcare sector to so many other areas of importance in the state of New Mexico. So it really warms my heart of having watched this grant grow over the last 15 years now, um, just the impact we're having. And it's because of the work of these great folks. So please give them another round of applause for their great efforts.
And right on point, Joseph P. Sanchez is the Program Operations Director at the College of Nursing. His work at the College of Nursing involves policy, legislative, workforce, strategic planning, and veteran and diversity initiatives. Have any free time? Huh? He already holds a master's degree in business administration from the University to the North, New Mexico Highlands University, and is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Choice, our flagship institution, the University of New Mexico. You could have clapped for UNM. Come on now. He is a PhD candidate, gonna do a great job, and he has currently over 13 years experience working with K through 12 public education in our beautiful land of enchantment. His work in public education has involved program and operational management, finance, contracting, policy, legislative analysis, and work working with vulnerable populations. In addition, he's been an entrepreneur and served as supply officer in the United States Navy. Thank you, Joseph Sanchez, for your service in our military. <laughs> Mr. Sanchez's dissertation topic is titled, Obamacare in New Mexico, the New Mexico Health Insurance, the New Mexico Health Insurance Exchange. Who or what influences and motivates Hispanic individuals to enroll? Phenomenal topic and critically important. This study seeks to explore the phenomenon of what drives individuals to enroll in the Affordable Care Act, also known as the New Mexico Health Insurance Exchange. The purpose of this research study is to describe the, the experiences and the factors that influence and motivate Hispanics, particularly from beautiful San Miguel County in northern New Mexico, to enroll in the New Mexico Health Exchange. This work is critical, and we're glad you're doing it. Thank you, Joseph P. Sanchez. Lori Steffen is unable to join us tonight, but she's got some great work going on. She is a fifth year PhD candidate in clinical psychology at UNM. Her dissertation focuses on predictors of daily quality life in lung cancer patients. In particular, lung cancer, lung cancer patients who have advanced disease. She regrets being unable to attend, but she's actually giving an oral presentation of her preliminary project results at the Society of Behavioral Health Medicine that's going on today and that keeps her from being present. So we won't dock her the 10%, right? <laughs> we'll give her a pass. Very seriously, lung cancer kills as many people in the United States as breast, colon, pancreatic, and prostate cancer combined. And it accounts for 160,000 cancer deaths per year. Only 15% of lung cancers are diagnosed at a localized stage where cancer can be cured. The majority of lung cancer patients will die from the disease. To help understand disease and individual factors that influence quality of life, 65 lung cancer patients with advanced disease are completing an initial questionnaire and then brief daily surveys for 21 consecutive days to document mood, treatment events, physical symptoms, and quality of life. For this project, Lori partnered with the New Mexico Cancer Care Alliance, an organization that aims to bring clinical trials to cancer centers and community clinics around the state of New Mexico. To date, 40 patients have been enrolled, and preliminary findings suggest that conducting intensive quality of life assessment with lung cancer patients is in fact feasible because the adherence to these daily surveys is at a rate of 97%. Preliminary findings also suggest that daily hope and a positive attitude to the extent to which a person sets goals and prioritizes important activities is directly related to less daily impairment from lung cancer symptoms and to a higher quality of daily life. Lori plans to use the data from her dissertation to inform either an additional assessment another study, or an intervention for lung cancer patients. This is phenomenal work. And talk about impacting people from the north to the south in our, in our beautiful state. This work will do just that. I wanna close with a note that Lori actually included to me. 
that I think really sums up why we do the work we do and why the GRD and the New Mexico Research Grant are so important and why I'm so proud of the work that GPSA continues to do each and every year. Lori says, I just want to add that I had a terrible time getting funding for this dissertation. It was nearly impossible to get national grant mechanisms to look at my project. National grant mechanisms felt like there was too much concern that you couldn't actually have feasibility studies with this universe of individuals that relates to hope and positive activity. But this NM research grant allowed her to do exactly that. And it allowed, she says, it allowed me to conduct a novel study with an incredibly underserved cancer population. I would not be doing this work. I simply would not be doing this work without the grant support GPSA has provided. Thank you for making this meaningful project possible and for helping me finish my degree at my flagship institution, the University of New Mexico. Signed, Lori. How about a round of applause for Lori and all our GSD recipients? In closing, congratulations again. Uh, Dr. Carl, I appreciate your great work. Thanks for being so impactful here at the University of New Mexico, helping us start a pilot project that has changed the way we deliver education for students across the state of New Mexico, and it's because of your good work and the students that have joined you tonight. So thank you again, and at this point, again, appreciate your tolerance. I'm right on time, and you've been very tolerant. Thanks for the applause. How about one more round before we give it back to the Vice President for Research? Come on down. Well, thank you, Brian, and uh, if, especially for all your work in establishing these awards. It, uh, it uh, really allows our graduate students to do the kind of work that they uh, aspire to do. And congratulations to all the uh, award winners. You reflect so well upon the university, and you make us all quite proud. Uh, now, uh, let me ask uh, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, Mark Pisani, to come up and give a formal introduction to uh, uh, Professor Carl Karlstrom. How old is the Grand Canyon? <laughs> we are fortunate here at the University of New Mexico to have the best person in the world to ask that question to. And that's the kind of thing that we always have to remember about what it means to be a flagship university. We need to have scholars who are the world's top experts in their areas of research. And Dr. Carl Karlstrom is one of the world's top scholars on the Grand Canyon, the Rocky Mountains, tectonics, and how that tells us about a very long history of the region in which we live. And I'm especially pleased that the advocate of a uh, young canyon will start his story about 1.8 billion years ago. That's the kind of scope of the work that, uh, that he does, that he traces the evolution of our planet over billions of years and has managed to publish more than 170 journal articles, hundreds, untold hundreds, of conference presentations and technical reports. And what I've learned as Dean is the most important thing, he has an H index of 42, which is huge. Number of articles published that have been cited at least that many times. And it's a sign that he is an internationally recognized scholar. People across the world appreciate his research, recognize it for its excellence. But another thing that is crucial about what it means to be a flagship university is to have scholars who not only are world leaders in the study of critically important problems, but also care deeply about transferring that knowledge to the public at large and to the students that we serve. 
And so I considered almost as important, not quite, but almost as important as his H index, the fact that, that he created the, I gotta get this right, the Trail of Time Geoscience Education Exhibition at Grand Canyon. Millions of people every year learn about the Grand Canyon from the work that Carl has done. And his ability to take very technical and uh, disciplined scientific research and translate that into exhibits that people from all over the world can understand is a sign of an extraordinary scholar, an extraordinary contributor to our understanding of the world. And for me, it's indeed almost as important as that and almost as important as his H index, the fact that every year he takes a couple of dozen students to the Grand Canyon in their first semester at the University of New Mexico and gives them an incredible experience, not just to be there, but to understand what that place means and to understand what that experience of the Grand Canyon should mean for their future as students at this university. He's transformed the lives of a lot of people wearing the right shirts here in the second row and a lot of people throughout this university who had that as a formative experience for their undergraduate careers. So it's, I'm incredibly privileged and pleased that Carl Karlstrom is a member of our faculty in the Depart uh, Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences and the College of Arts and Sciences because he's exactly what being a flagship university should be all about. So please, join me in welcoming him. Brian, I, I do have the mic and I can walk around, so I intend to do that. And can you hear me in the back okay, Berto? Can you hear? Okay. Um, thank you, Dean Peasney. Thank you, Vice President Dewar, for a nice uh, introduction. And, uh, you know, I'm really impressed that this 60th award, I'm so honored to get it, but I really like the fact that it's associated with the Shared Learning Conference and the, and the recognition of these students and their work, move that down, uh, is, is really a great thing to, to see the variety of neat uh, work that's being funded. And uh, so I appreciate that. I appreciate the honor of, of being the 60th. I'm very honored also to have so many of my past students here who are gonna help me with this presentation. I need the support and the, uh, the time perspective that they can give me. Uh, my family's here, appreciate you guys traveling. Uh, here to this event. And in fact, um, so many people in the audience I sort of consider extended family, my collaborators. And uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a very fun to be up here. I want to tell you about Grand Canyon and I want to tell you about geology. And of course, I'm terrified that any of this is going to work properly, but so far, so good. The title of my talk um, took me a while to figure out, and the part that I was worried about was that 40 years. So 40 years is the time since I started graduate work on the tectonics of the western U.S. Um, so I thought that was okay, but I could have done 30, which is the amount of time I've been funded to do research in the western U.S. in the Grand Canyon, but I could have picked 50 too. 50 was when I was an undergraduate student and uh, presumably formulating my, my professional identity, which I didn't know at the time. But uh, so the time aspect, you know, what's a decade, 50 or 40 or 30, but uh, I thought I compromised with 40. So it's been a long time that I've been working on this particular problem, which is the uh, place-based, a lot of education really benefits in geology. Some people identify with the place, and uh, I have certainly done that over uh, my career. So I want to start off with a time perspective, 
And now none of the students can answer this, but is there anyone in the audience that knows to the age of the Earth, to several significant digits? Does anybody know? You do? Five billion years. Anyone else? That's, that's not too bad, but I want more significant digits. Anybody? 4.567. How did you know that? I do this in my classes all the time, and it, you know, people start looking at the slides eventually. But geology is the study of the Earth, Earth processes, and Earth history. And so I have students from the about a decade worth of freshman learning communities uh, here to help me, and some graduate students, and some people from my petrology class and my structural geology class. And uh, I want them to be a timeline for me. So let's think about, there's the age of the Earth back there, chair number 46. And uh, I want to I move forward in time a little bit. Um, we don't know much about those six chairs. Each chair is 100 million years in my timeline, by the way. Um, but we know the oldest dated rock is 4 billion years old. Tanner, are you the oldest dated rock? OK. And uh, that early 600 million years, we know quite a bit about from meteorites, et cetera. But not here on Earth, not much of a record. Soon after the Earth became a planet, we think life was established. So there's, there's uh, 3.8 billion years. So you're just single cell life, you're kind of, you know. <laughs> but Diana will tell you, micro, microbes still dominate the Earth. So there they are, starting early in Earth history. Um, OK, the, we'll get to Grand Canyon. The oldest grains in the Grand Canyon, 3.3, chair 33 in my timeline, extending down to, what are you, Andrew, chair 29 or something? OK, you better stand up, too. <laughs> so these are, these are very old grains. We have no rocks, but we have the evidence that there was crust around being washed into sediment in the Grand Canyon. Here we go with the oldest Grand Canyon rocks. Mark, are you 1840? Uh, where's, where's, where's chair 18? Are you chair 18? 1.8 billion. That's the oldest rock in the Grand Canyon. The record back through there is a bit fragmentary. And now starting here, we have a record in the Grand Canyon. Besides the grains, you're important, but pretty fragmentary. OK, so thank you guys for representing the early history of the Earth. Um, from here on out, we're dealing with actual uh, a lot of events. I'll kind of run through them. We'll just do the timeline quickly. Uh, let's see. The assembly of the supercontinent of Rodinia. See, we've, we've come quite a ways. And the whole history of the Earth is a breakup of supercontinents and their reassembly. The fragments move around. And uh, so the, the Rodinia is Russian term for the motherland. The mother of Pangaea is Rodinia. So thank you for that. Um, let's see. Animal life. Now, not single-celled microbial things, but animal life uh, came on board in the chair six there and really exploded in diversity at the Cambrian explosion of life at uh, 542. And then, you know, fish and, and uh, other things came along. And uh, let's see, here's Pangaea supercontinent, second supercontinent. Where was Rodinia? Back, uh, there you were, okay. So about that much time between the breakup of all the plates and then coming back together. Um, uh, where am I? Dinosaurs, you know, came along chair two over there, and they went extinct during the last chair. And uh, so we have a lot of events in the last chair. Chris, you've got a big responsibility to think about this last 100 million years. And then, of course, we get to human time frames with uh, Things like early hominids, about the age of the young Grand Canyon, six million years, people were evolving, uh, proto people in uh, Africa. And then, it, critical to New Mexico, this archaeology, the last uh, thousand years. And I want to think of that as thousands of generations, because I want to make the point that this is my family and several generations. We have these human time scales, and grandparents and parents. And I, I want to dedicate this talk to my mother, who's here. And uh, Florence Carlstrom, if you stand up. <laughs> you 
both my parents were academics, uh, professionals. My mother is a sociologist in the uni Northern Arizona University for her uh, teaching career, and my father a geologist. And so I, uh, that's one generation of geologists, here's another. And my son's in the audience, he's a third generation. No, he's a geophysicist, sorry, Leith. <laughs> <laughs> and there's biologists and musicians and lots of interesting, but so think about the human time frame, okay, and then say, who cares about a million or a billion years ago? Nobody. <laughs> well, think about the things that are important in terms of sustaining cultures and, and uh, areas where human time frames and geologic time frames can come together. Things like um, nuclear waste disposal. Things like climate change, which are, is coming along. How fast, we need to know that. Things like resources. Everything in this room came from the earth in terms of geology resources. So these are things, we're a planet with a huge number of people. The number of people is expanding. The planet's getting smaller in a sense. The need for earth and planetary sciences and geology is ever more critical as humans need to find a sustainable niche on, on our planet. So hence my emphasis, I want to reinforce Mike Dewar's comment about education and research. They really have to go together uh, because the future of research is in the hands of the young people who are uh, coming along behind the old people. So part one of my talk is really deep time. You guys back there are even deeper, but starting about, where's, where was, here we go. They're starting with the L's chasm and ice. And the history of the Earth is written in rocks. And we've got to learn how to read them. And that's geologists' job is to try and understand. I'm going to talk about these gnarly looking rocks in the inner gorge. They're at the bottom because they're the oldest. This contact here is the great unconformity. And from there on up is way over here, explosion of life and all that. So those rocks are way before the explosion of animal life. But I want to talk about, and how do you, so you go to a rock and you say, tell me about yourself. This rock's already telling us some stuff. This rock is fairly light colored, it's low density. It has these beautiful folds telling us that it would behave like taffy in the deep part of a mountain belt when two plates collided. It, it, was, it was really hot because these melts came in through and intruded it. Uh, how old are you? Mm. Okay, so now we have to apply analytical tools. We have to pull the zircon grains out of that rock, and we have to apply uranium lead dating to this crystal. Maybe we want to know the age of the core of the crystal or the rim, and maybe we want to know a bit about its heritage. So this grain came from a parentage, as any of us have done, and it has a record not only of its age, but its melt source region. So. Uh, deep in the mountain belt, these are the Grand Canyon's rocks. They were assembled by collision of, of island arcs like Philippines or Borneo. Did you know Australia is moving north right now into New Guinea, Java and Sumatra, and they're being accreted onto the side of Australia? That's the story I'm going to tell you about the southwest, New Mexico and uh, Arizona. So but these rocks were deep in the guts of a mountain belt we call the Vishnu Mountains, just because the Vishnu Schist was named by John Wesley Powell for some of these basement rocks. And this is one of the signs from our Trail of Time uh, uh, exhibit. It tries to put things in words that people can comprehend. We were supposed to make these conversational so that people don't like to stop sometimes because they're talking with their family. And uh, so they would be walking along and sometimes we'd listen in and, and they'd walk by and. And someone would say, did you know that the continents formed as Earth plates collided? And the other would say, yeah, OK. And so anyway, they kind of teach each other, and it's been very successful. So here's an animation done by a postdoc of mine, Steve Whitmire and myself, that depicts in a way the way North America's come together. It's going to go by pretty fast. And time over here greater than 2 billion over on the side of the timeline. There are all these old blocks in North America, and they came together and we're stitched together. Oh, I like that one. That's about the scale of the Himalayan collision. This would be equivalent of India colliding with Asia and this curvilinear mountain belt 
that's now been eroded records the assembly of the core of our common. And now here's where I did my PhD some 40 years ago, started with that. And uh, I looked at this boundary between the core of the continent and the nothingness that was there at the time at 1.8 and tried to understand how this crust in Arizona and New Mexico came together. Came together as these island arcs that uh, were collided one by one, uh, different times over here on the right, to build a south, kind of like an onion with its different shells and stitched by these granites and eventually at this time colliding with, with other continents all around and kind of sealed in the center of the Rodinian supercontinent. So it's a very heterogeneous plate developed through time by successive addition of terrains colliding blocks and uh, I think that's kind of exciting. At a large temporal and spatial scale we can think of it as a contractional plate margin that existed for a long time. But remember, we're, uh, Tobias, I took this from you. We have to be grounded with, with uh, the observation. We're taking this information from rocks. So just remember, these are models, and they're going to be refined by the next generation of students. But the rocks are still going to be there to tell us their story. This is Mike Williams at UMass, George Garrels at Arizona, Mark Holland, my PhD student, myself, pondering about these granites and their field relationships. And I want to show you some new work that we're doing. This is supposed to be a research lecture, so I'm, I'm sprinkling in a little technical stuff, not too much, but uh, the Earth, uh, Earth's mantle, two-thirds of the Earth by volume is its mantle, and it's been evolving since back here when it formed at 4.6 in terms of two isotopes, lutetium-176 and hafnium-176, a parent and a daughter, and the evolution of the ratio of those has changed through time in a pretty systematic way we call the depleted mantle evolution curve. It's a model too. But if you think about that granite that we were just looking at and where it came from, we can get its age. So this is time on the bottom by dating the zircons. Now I'm interested in its heritage, its parentage. What does it remember about its, its uh, ancestry? If, it turns out if you melt mantle, say back here, you separate out the daughter into the crust that you created at that time, one of these arcs, and it evolves along a different evolution path. So that if you found two rocks, both could have the same age, but they'd have very different hafnium isotope ratios, which would tell you that this one was sucked out of the mantle at 1.6 billion, whereas the same age rock across the way actually evolved within the crust. It was derived from, from recycled or uh, um, remelted crust. So here's some data, it's new data, brand new actually, and uh, Mark Holland and I are working on it and some others. Um, here's one of these Elves Chasm, um, thank you, the Elves oldest rock, you get a lot of press here, in the southwest, oldest one in New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona. And that rock, the hafnium isotopes, say that, it, that's good, you can sit down. The, um, the, uh, this granite was derived from the mantle at the same time it crystallized into the crust about the same time. So it was a juvenile outboard oceanic arc. So Whitmire and Karlstrom are going to be supported by Holland and Karlstrom here, I hope, for that one. That's good. Um, so this is the idea if you melt the depleted mantle that you can form a granite up here in the arc and it remembers that it came from the mantle. Whereas one like this if it was melting older crust, it would remember it came from older crust. So that's the idea. That's the igneous part of the half name story. The sedimentary part is that these arcs can now shed detritus, sand grains, zircon grains, into basins, and we can look at sedimentary rocks like this and, and know what was being eroded at the time. So pretty powerful uh, in a fragmentary, uh, very old story to use the half name isotopes and the zircons. So look at the difference between the Elves Chasm nice here which was oceanic and outboard. And this terrain, Mojave terrain, which has lots of older stuff. In fact, these have older grains, even in the igneous rock. Uh-oh, there we go. And in the detritus over here, the same thing. So the, there was an older continent shedding stuff into this block, and it didn't come from here, according to one of my recent students. It came from out here, some terrain out there 
of unknown affinity because the zircons here don't really match Wyoming very well. Okay, so then as you get younger, yes, indeed, the Yavapai was juvenile at 1700. It was, and not only that, but not only the granites, but the basins saw nothing but young material. So it couldn't have been anywhere close to the continent. So this, this idea of things coming in and adding on, originated in the oceans, added to the continent, works pretty well. At the time of this Mazatzal province, the igneous rocks tell us, indeed, it's new material from the mantle. The sedimentary things that I was telling us, ah, oh, we're getting this little stuff washed in from older crust. So anyway, uh, we kept going with younger and younger things to look at the heritage of these different provinces. And we end up with this story for, for North America, a bunch of belts added to the core. They're truncated at rift margins at both sides. This is an old paper of, of mine that says, maybe Australia was that continent that was connected to the Western US. We called it Oswas model. It's still, in, it's still hanging in there. There's a lot of competitors, though. This could have been uh, Antarctica, and it could have been South China, as I'll show you in a minute. Up here, though, everyone agrees the belts continued on into Baltica, into Scandinavia. That's my heritage, too, so I like that. OK, so here's, here's, this is North American-centric, as if it didn't move. But of course, this whole animation, North America was at the equator and rotating. But anyway, relative to North America, you can see, oh, South China's there, not Australia. Who did this animation? One of my postdocs. Hmm. And then, again, North America's not stable, but relative to the other continents, they shift around. You don't even recognize their shapes, but that's Congo Craton, Amazon Craton, West Africa, North China, South China, Siberian Craton. These are the cores of these other continents, just like Canada is a core of ours. So this sets us up for the next supercontinent. This is the Rodinian supercontinent came together, rifted apart. These are the southern cratons that have been called Gondwana within Pangina, Pangaea and Laurasia. Uh, just a little funny story. This is uh, the, the IGCP, the International Geologic Congress, had a grant. They give you status but no money, you know. <laughs> and so it wasn't really a grant. Sorry, we should turn that one off. I'm not going to get closer. <laughs> so each continent had one person to come represent it. And I was the a representative for North America. And there was one from, from uh, Antarctica and one from Kalahari, or one from Africa and one from South America. And we all got together and we battled about what this should look like. Because it's very difficult to see exactly how these things would, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And we didn't. Uh, so this was the consensus view. And the consensus view, as you know, is never right. It's a compromise. People with good ideas got pushed aside, others. But we were there at the very last day of this meeting, and we still couldn't come together. So this Chinese guy named uh, Li uh, put this together. And that's why South China slipped in there between North America and Australia. <laughs> but that's OK. It's, uh, it's food for the next generation to work on. Now. Um, Mike Timmons is here. I've got to apologize, Mike. The supergroup, where's 11 and 12? Okay. Grand Canyon supergroup is an important set of rocks in Grand Canyon. I'm just not going to talk about it. It's okay. He said it's all right. That was his dissertation. And, uh, and, uh, but they're the tilted rocks. Suffice it to say, they're the tilted rocks. But they record the assembly of Rodinia and its breakup, the animation I just showed you. This one now is Pangaea. You'll recognize it. The continents begin to look like. They do now, and if this animation will work, this is from YouTube, so who knows? Kind of blurry, but I like this. Okay, so the Atlantic Ocean starting to open here. Um, I love it with it when India makes a break for it. You know, 100, 150 million years ago, it's heading up there, and it's starting about 50 million years. It starts colliding with Asia. This is what happened just before Rodinia was assembled and sealed, all those belts sealed off. But um, so New Mexico has essentially the same history, this basement. And I'm not going to go through it, but, but we have just as much work done here in New Mexico and Colorado as in Grand Canyon. 
not quite as good a record. So let's see. No supergroup. You guys would have to leave if we're talking about New Mexico. Um, no Cambrian, so chairs five and four would have to go. We could stay with three, two, and one. No stay put. But the idea would be there's a little less record here in New Mexico, but still it's spectacularly exposed. We still have the great unconformity there with the Paleozoic rocks on top of the basement rocks. And so many of the same things. Okay, so that's part one. Now part two, I'm gonna just completely change time scales. We're talking about billions, hundreds of millions, and now this is where Chris becomes very important. All the rest of this talks about you, Chris, every single thing. Okay, you're good with that. Okay, so does anybody know the age of the Grand Canyon? You're all looking at the slide, it's not there. <laughs> I tricked you. Um, anybody read in the news? Yamani, 17, Victor, 17, that's, I just want some numbers. 17 million? 70? 17. Is there a 70 million year old Grand Canyon person out here? Probably so, five to six. Anyway, it's all in that last chair. And, and uh, so I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, and, and the age of the Grand Canyon here is very much tied into the age of this river system, Colorado River that carved it. It's very much tied into the uplift of the Rockies, which is the snow melt that goes down the river to carve the canyon. So the whole western U.S., the uplift of the western U.S., and the age of the Grand Canyon, those problems are this deeply entwined, shall we say. Uh, so it's the Green River, Colorado, Grand Canyon through here. Gulf of California, that's entwined too. When did you have a place for the water to go into the opening Gulf of California? So we have another project going on the Rio Grande right now. Marissa's here working on that. And uh, these continental scale river systems are very sensitive gauges to landscape evolution. So we're trying to use the rivers to tell us things like we ask the rocks to tell us for the deep time. Uh, our main message for tourists at Grand Canyon is the rocks are old and the canyon is young. And that fundamental concept is maybe self-evident, but there are a surprising number of people to go, oh. So those rocks that are in the walls of the canyon are very old, and this river that carved the canyon is very young. But now we'll get to how young in a minute. John Wesley Powell started out this debate. What's the age of the Colorado River? What's the age of the Grand Canyon? Uh, way back in the late 1800s. And this debate's continuing today. This, in 2014, I, I got to go to Leadville, Colorado, of all places, and debate uh, Rebecca Flowers, who's from the Caltech Boulder Group. 250 people came to the debate about the age of the Grand Canyon. She's an old Grand Canyon person. I'm a young Grand Canyon person, or I was. Uh, and this uh, headline of the Albuquerque Journal came out the day after the Super Bowl. And we, Grand Canyon got the front page. So we're proud of that. People love the Grand Canyon. They're interested in it, how old as it is. If the Broncos had won a bit, we wouldn't have got there. <laughs> but that's okay. We did. So here's the debate. So the young Grand Canyon, Chris, if you could slide over to the last very edge of your seat. Okay, that's six million year old Grand Canyon. Don't fall off. The old Grand Canyon is 70 to 50. A 17 million year old Grand Canyon would be in between. This new paper that we think is the solution to this 150-year-old debate is what we call the Paleo Canyon Solution, which is, well, there might have been some old segments. In fact, we know where they are. But, and there's some intermediate age segments. But the main thing has been carved in the last five or six million years by this river. So here's, an old, here's the old, the 70. You can occupy 7 tenths of your seat. Um, that there was an island arc here, or a, a continental arc, the Sierra Nevadas, that's not controversial. There was a Cretaceous inland sea. New Mexico was at sea level 70 million years ago, and we were right on the beach, good beachfront property. And this river, according to this old canyon model, went exactly through Grand Canyon from the highlands to the sea, in exactly the same place, and within had carved Grand Canyon to almost its present depth. And then the drainage reversed, and the Arizona River, as he calls it, at 50 million, where's that, 55, reversed and came out the other way, right exactly through the Grand Canyon. So in this model, Grand Canyon, same place, 
almost the same depth by 50 million years, half your seat, right? Okay. And out came the press. The press loves the Grand Canyon, as so many people do. And did dinosaurs gawk at the Grand Canyon? And new geologic evidence indicates the Grand Canyon is as old as the dinosaurs and may have lumbered on the edge. And we were working on the Trail of Time and we were working with museum people and we were talking about misconceptions. And how do you get past people's misconceptions? And so I stuck this in here thinking that people must think kind of like the Flintstones, that the, that the canyon was exactly the same and the dinosaurs lumbered across it. And I got all offended and, and uh, so then uh, the back and forth in science is very important. And uh, you can be collegial and still disagree, of course, uh, heartily. But, and then a series of papers, the uh, Asmarone Poliak paper in Science 2008, this is 17 million year old canyon, great data set about speleothems. The Flowers paper using thermal chronology, which I'll tell you a little about, the second technical part of the talk is coming, beware. Um, Brian Werdeke with his old canyon, new canyon model. The new method, appetite for three dating, applied to an old problem in, uh, in science. Um, a paper by Sherry Kelly who's here and myself and, and John Lee saying now we still think the canyon's young, the same kind of evidence. And then this, this we, we fancy might be the resolution of this long debate, but that's until the next paper comes out. So it's an active research projects generating a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm, a little bit of funding. It's, uh, it's fantastic. So here's our trip. We start at Lee's Ferry in our boats, go south in Marble Canyon across the Kaibab uplift. This is the thing John Wesley Powell worried about. Why does the river go across the high the uplift? Stupid river should go around. But it goes across and then it ends up crossing this fault system which is the active basin and range fault, and eventually into the basin and range off the Colorado Plateau, we take out 280 miles later at Pierce Ferry on these trips. So how do we, how do we solve this problem of an erosional landscape? This is, this is a landscape that's been etched by rivers and wind and, and all sorts of uh, interesting erosional features have taken the evidence away, it's gone. So how do you, how do you reconstruct a puzzle when the evidence is gone. You don't have the pieces. They've been taken down the river and redeposited somewhere. It's a very uh, impressive river. This is one of the impressive rapids. And look from the top, it looks like this little green thing. But down there, it's a roar roaring, raging uh, torrent. And uh, we have these boats. This is probably the country's smallest and least expensive NSF facility. <laughs> UNM, or, uh, NSF bought two of these 22-foot boats for us, and we, uh, this is the front of it, kind of a pontoon thing with a, with a frame, and this is the back of it. We have these motors. And Lori and I know what's about to happen, but the students look a little clueless, don't they? <laughs> but, um, so we'll see if this works. This is a 2005 run of Lava Falls. You want to miss this hole here, that's the ledge hole that can flip boats, so we're off to the right of that. And then here's where we're all going to get pretty wet. Not too bad. And then you don't want to be too far right because the cheese grater rock is coming up on the right down below. And there it is. You think we're going to hit it? Are we too far right, Mike? We'll see. There's Mike Timmons down at the bottom. He's always keeping us safe on these trips in the eddy. And uh, we made it a successful run. It's called ABL, Live Below Lava. Yeah, very significant part of the trip. Pull into the eddy and uh, go have a party or do some geology or both. So I want to talk about the age of the canyon and this magnificent river. How long has it been carving through rock to carve the canyon? I'm going to do it in segments. Marble Canyon, Eastern Grand Canyon, Muev Gorge, the segment along the fault, and the western. And our logic is, if the old model is right, the old canyon model, then it was carved in its same place into its present depth. 
50 to 70 million years ago. So if any one of these segments is young, poof, we just proved that hypothesis, or at least the extreme end member of it. Sometimes it's easier to disprove hypotheses than to prove them. So we'll go to Marble Canyon first. No basement here, just the Paleozoic rocks, just you, last three or four chairs. And uh, the river's carving through the Little Colorado. Lots of interesting stories. But we're focusing, focusing on this void where the material go that used to be there. And then Eastern Grand Canyon is wider. It's a mile deep and 10 miles wide. And there's a lot of material that's gone. So we want the record of when that took off out of there. And how do you get that? Um, use this thing called thermochronology. We talked about ge geochronology, which was the age of the rocks. And then the half name isotopes, which is the isotopic composition of the rocks. But thermochronology asks the mineral of the rock usually individual minerals like the appetite. Um, when did you cool through some, some, something or other temperature? So apologies to Matt, we're not gonna do high temperature thermochronology, we're just gonna share, do Sherry's thing with a low, low temperature. But um, we use appetites. These are little grains in the sandstone or the, or the granite too. And this one's been etched, and you see these tracks that Sherry knows how to analyze and count. But the basic idea is, these uranium in the, in the appetite, periodically and fairly regularly, the nucleus breaks in half, spontaneously fissions, goes through the lattice and just rips away through the, through the lattice, creating a track. And if you etch the grain, you can uh, see those tracks and you can count them. So here's the way it works, but here's the trick. If the grain is hotter than its closure temperature, usually around 110, then the tracks form like that but it's hot enough that the lattice anneals. So they form and they anneal, and, and I'm, not getting, I'm not accumulating anything to count until the grain cools through 110. And then the tracks form and they actually are preserved and we've got a, a chronometer. How long has it been since it passed through that temperature, 110 degrees C? That's about three or four kilometers deep in a normal geotherm. So we've got something about uh, it's timing. And then this slightly newer technique called, oh, frigging track. Oh, it's even better than that. It's not just when it cooled through 110, but because the track lengths shorten in this thing called the partial annealing zone, the track forms and then it shortens up a bit. And then another one forms and shortens up, shortens up, shortens up, shortens up. We still have a chronometer because we can count the tracks, but now we have a track length distribution which tells us how long it sat in this partial annealing zone. So we're filling in the, the temperature gap between 110 and 60. And then this relatively newer method, appetite helium, is a more traditional parent-daughter decay where the uranium thorium uh, decay to helium-4, an alpha particle. And above 60 degrees, that's the helium diffuses out of the crystal and you have zero age. After about 60, you get more helium in it with more time that the mineral was cold. It's better than that because it turns out not all appetites are the same and uh, they have different amounts of uranium. And so a crystal with a lot of uranium like this versus a small amount have different amount of radiation damage. And it's not too intuitive, but the more damage there is in the lattice, the more it holds in the daughter product and therefore it has a higher closure temperature and therefore you get an older age from the thing. So we can, if we combine these methods, appetite fission track, appetite helium, we can get semi-continuous time temperature paths that the, that the mineral took, the minerals, since they cooled through 110. So now we can begin to say, okay, what was happening way above us, because the rock is remembering when it was deep and it was remembering when it got shallow and times when it got rapidly shallower, so temperature time paths or a clue. And so here's, here's the thing. Uh, thermochronology works because Earth gets hotter with depth. These are called isotherms or geotherms. We know that because we drill holes and go into caves and it's hotter down there. Um, and then it tells us about the surface. If you have a, a sample on the rim of the Grand Canyon today and the base, and if you took the idea there was no canyon at the time those minerals cooled, then you'd shave off stuff with your sandpaper and erode this down, and this one would cool through 60 degrees first, you keep, and then this one would cool later. 
So that would tell you there was no Paleo Canyon above the modern canyon when these grains cooled. On the other hand, if there was an old canyon up there, you already had that shape and it's carved sandpapering down and the rim and the river might give you the same age. Tell you that at the time they cooled through 60 degrees, there was a canyon up there. So here's how we do it. We get grain constraints. Uh, let's see if this works. So we start with our geologic knowledge. These rocks were deep at the time of the Cretaceous Seaway because we know there was strata on top. And they were at the surface in time for the Bidahochi Formation to come on top. And then we do a forward model, uh, inverse model, sorry, and uh, random paths are generated. We tell it has to go through that box and that box. But we don't tell it anything else. There's five grains that are talking to the model. And those five grains give good fits to the data in this purple zone and acceptable fits through the green zone. So we have a time temperature path, oops, which looks something like this. So that one cooled, I'll come back to it, cooled quickly at 20 million years, which told us, tells us that that grain was deep at 60, uh, 60 million years ago, cooling through this isotherm about 60 degrees, sorry, two, um, 20 million years ago it was passing through that isotherm. And then you eroded stuff off the top and now it's at the surface and you collected it and you can project that there was actually, you collected it down here, you get a, a, a 20 million year age for when it passed through 60 degrees and you know that the paleo surface was way up there somewhere. So you're reconstructing past landscapes, it's pretty magical really. Um, but that tells us that this section of the canyon's young. There was no canyon there 20 million years ago. It was deep, it got shallower, and then it stayed. In fact, this one didn't get rapidly cooled until the last six million years. So that one's telling us that the carving of Marble Canyon is in the last six million years. This is a neat story in the Eastern Grand Canyon, a rim sample, a rim sample, and a sample from the base. Here they are in schematic form. And the green is the rim sample, the purple is the river bottom sample. Look, they're 30 or 40 degrees different in temperature for tens of millions of years. And then um, at 25 million years, in fact, they were, you can reconstruct a past landscape that was up there. And uh, at 20 million years, the two things have come to the same temperature. They're still deep, but it tells you that there was a canyon up there. And so, we now know that there was an East Kaibab Paleo Canyon up there somewhere in the air starting about 25 to 15. We don't know its shape very well, but we say, okay, well, what if it was like the modern Little Colorado or modern Zion Canyon, which are carved into the same rocks that used to be here in the Grand Canyon region? And we say, okay, it was a canyon that went across here, didn't go out this way, as I'll show you in a minute, didn't come down here, as I just showed you, so we call it the East Kaibab Paleo Canyon, and instead of a young canyon, an old canyon, we have an intermediate age canyon. So that's a major discovery, we think, of this Lee et al. paper and then the Carl Sturm et al. solution. And we have gorge segment, we've got samples in the mill, but we don't have data. The Western Grand Canyon, here's that segment along the fault. A bunch of remnants of paleo gravel, so now geology weighs in. And believe me, geology trumps thermochronology. Sorry, Sherry, but you agree with that? I agree with that too. So these are remnants of past rivers, and the gravels are still there, and we can date them, and we can look at the class and see where they came from. And so this blue was 50 to 70 that flowed off to the north, so there was an old segment. This green was 35 or so, but it was derived from this escarpment coming across here, and the red were basalts coming down, paleo valleys, and, which was base level. There was no segment here. This one was completely covered by those fans at the time when the old canyon is supposed to exist. So we look across to the north. Here's modern Grand Canyon. You can sort of see its trace. These are these old de river deposits at the level of the base level at that time. And some of these were derived from these northern escarpments because they look like this. And the class could only have come, we think, from that northern escarpment. And we see, in fact, the way the, the grains are leaning to the left, we know the direction the river was carrying them. So we have this story that this 
Western Grand Canyon geologically is young, last six million years, carved about a kilometer, but that opens up a whole new potential to refine thermal chronology. It's right at the edge of what this new and powerful technique can resolve. So um, this is the, the black lines are the flowers and Farley model that says that it cooled quickly and stayed cold. That's how they got the idea that it was carved in its present location to near its modern depth 70 million years ago. Our models, this one I like, uh, this is now reinforced by new 4.3 data, but look at all the mess here of different paths. The reason is we don't quite understand helium diffusion in appetite yet. We don't know the effects of radiation damage over long periods of time in slowly cooled rocks. So this is a research laboratory that's enabling us to refine analytical techniques which then can be used to give us sort of magical information about past landscapes. So here's the, here's the solution, Paleo Canyon solution, Marble Canyon's young, East Kaibab's intermediate, Hurricane is old, flowed north. We're testing right now whether we can find grains up there that match source regions here, and the westernmost canyon was young. Where do these rivers go? This is a fun uh, proposal by Jim Sears that there was a continental arc here, like I was saying before, as the Andean scale western U.S., and that there was a river that flowed all the way here to Labrador. Jim Sears is a wild and creative thinker. It's not unreasonable that something like the modern Andes with rivers that originate in the mountains might go all the way across the continent into the ocean. So put a big question mark here, and we'll see if that's testable and uh, if it holds up to the scrutiny of additional testing. So we think this Paleo Canyon solution models the ideas of different age segments of the canyon that were all um, linked together by the Colorado River in the last five to six million years to create this dramatic landscape. Okay, so hang on, part three. This is, and now it's the outreach part. As year after year we work down there, people are interested in it, and um, questions come along, the press asks questions, documentaries are being filmed, et cetera. We started thinking, okay, there's a lot of people interested in our research, imagine, even though it's so long ago. And so uh, this was from the Visitor Center movie, I'm hanging from a rope. Uh, repelling off the Kaibab, and uh, it's a dramatic scene. The helicopter comes in, and I'm just a tiny speck, and then it finally gets in where you can see it's a person, and the audience gasps, and, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't have anything to do with geology, nothing. <laughs> but it's spectacular, and, uh, but this has a lot to do with geology. Trail of Time, we're really proud of this, Lori and I, over 15 years now, you know, we have long careers, and you gotta set your sights high for something that might be a legacy for your work, and we kind of feel like the trail of time is. Uh, this is uh, St Steve Martin, who was like the fourth superintendent after we proposed it to the park, and he finally uh, helped make it happen. Me and Laurie, this is Judy Bryant, the interpretation chief, Steve Semkin from ASU, Ryan Crow, my PhD student, and Mike Williams from UMass, and this team, mm -hmm. Uh, created this thing. This was the 1995 drawing. Carl, I call it Carl Draw. It's a computer program I know. It uses a pencil. Uh, and the park didn't know where to do, put this thing. And even when they agreed, and we got a bunch of money from the NSF to do it so the park didn't have to pay anything, uh, they didn't know what to do. But we finally, location, 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 we got this place between the geology Yavapai, the, the Yavapai Geology Museum, which we were helping <coughs> renovate and modernize, and the village where El Tavar is, and this is about two kilometers long, where each meter is a million years of the trail. So perfect location, five million people a year come. We made these portals with uh, greetings, welcome to the trail of time, congratulations, you've walked that far, et cetera. Um, these were made from the real rocks, so each of these layers was collected in the bottom of the Grand Canyon and brought up, and then every step, a long step like that's a meter, and every step is a million years. And you count down and the, we put the rocks at their birthdays along the trail. And to connect the rocks to the, in the canyon they're seeing to the place on the timeline, we use this really sophisticated interpretation device called a viewing tube. And the park wanted computer things or something. We said, no, a viewing tube would be fine. And it works good. These are our wayside panels. This is the one for the top rock, 270 million. 
And then we decided a million years is such a long time and each step is so, so much can happen in a million years. Let's do a sort of an on-ramp, as Laurie calls it, onto the trail of time, uh, where you expand that million years into uh, climate change events, uh, volcanic eruption events, earthquake events, things that people can relate to. Uh, and then the arrival of, of peoples uh, in the last uh, 10,000 years in the case of Grand Canyon. That's one tenth of your chair there, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So here's, we call it the magic meter and encodes all that last stuff. We collected rocks by helicopter, by, from the river. Here's my brother. We, we allowed biologists to help <laughs> carry these rocks. And we carried them like, you know, like dead people on the stretchers. They're really, rocks are heavy. You notice that? And dirty. But anyway, so we collected tons and tons of the rocks and boats, carried them down, bent the frames, looked for fossils because the history of life is encoded in these younger rocks. And the park for in-kind support was supposed to install it, the trail crew, and they didn't do a bit. So UNM students and us installed 2,500 markers in the trail of time, and we're really proud of it. And, and the, the student involvement in this is exemplified by this video. It was made, made by uh, Brent Hall, who's here with his son, a junior scientist. There he is over there. Great time lapse. There are those five million people. They love to touch the rocks. Some of them. <laughs> so here's the freshman learning communities. Each year we go there in a big, big bus. And uh, then we camp at this place called Mather Campground. Some of them have never camped before. So they rent stuff at Johnson, uh, Johnson Gym or whatever. And some of those tents don't have poles and, and sometimes a little tiny tent and there's four of them that are gonna sleep in it. And uh, anyway, we have campfire every night. We, have, we pair with public speaking. So it's uh, Geology 101 and public speaking. Around the campfire, they talk about their experiences. We use our river kitchen for cooking. And here we are, we're going to the Grand Canyon because the, the, the Mather campground's way off the side and they don't even know the canyon's there practically. Uh, Joel Nossoff, who, who uh, helped with the FLC program for so many years. And there are the students, mostly in red. We try to get them all in red. Welcome to the Trail of Time, a geology timeline. There's Tanner. Same hat, look. And here's that magic meter, I'm trying to explain it. It's difficult, how you switch time scales. I'm telling them all about the tilted layers and the horizontal layers. And there's a mnemonic for remembering the names of the layers. Rock layers have names. And the, the mnemonic is know the canyon's history, study rocks made by time. So K is for Kaibab, T is for Toroweep, et cetera. So it helps them. So here we're going up, uh, must be Redwall. No, this super group. So there's the tapetes, made by time, made by time. Muev, bright angel, tapetes. And you know, we try and get students to observe because the geology is an observational science with so much to learn by just paying attention to what's in front of you. So they sketch the layers, they try and see the relationships between the layers and uh, fill their notebooks with observations and thoughts. So there's a canyon up here, 25 to 15. How about that? And of course, you can't experience Grand Canyon without hiking it. So we hike them down. This is Jason Ricketts, past PhD student. There's the same hat, Tanner. And we go to Plateau Point and look down in the basement rocks. We used to take them all the way to the river, but we nearly lost a few, so we don't do that anymore. <laughs> 
There's the unconformity with the basement rocks and their history of the assembly of the North American continent separated from the rocks which record the evolution of life on Earth. How'd you get that rainbow? That's amazing. Then we go to Meteor Crater, because really the oldest rock on Earth came from the solar system, not, not from Earth. And we talk about the meteorite impact and the 4.567 age of the Earth, which comes from meteorites. So thanks to Joel Nassoff and Brent Hall for providing that. Thank you, Carl. I feel a lot younger than when this talk started. <laughs> um, Carl, in recognition of your outstanding work over the uh, years at uh, University of New Mexico, I'd like to present you with this citation on behalf of all the faculty uh, to show our appreciation uh, for all that you've done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. There's just a couple more uh, groups of folks I'd like to thank for this. You know, Carl mentioned earlier when he started about how this was integrated with the Shared uh, Knowledge Conference, and that was uh, intentional this year. We wanted to sort of have a, have a week, or at least a part of a week, where we celebrated all the research that's going on in the university. So uh, the Graduate Research uh, Council uh, spent a lot of time trying to integrate all of the research celebrations across the university and the various departments. Uh, today we had the Shared Knowledge Conference. It uh, culminated with uh, Carl's lecture tonight. And so all of you who were involved in that, Kyoko Simmons and uh, Talal St. Long, uh, my office staff, especially Lauren Madrano, who, who by the way, is you are prohibited from coming into work tomorrow. You must take the day off tomorrow. Uh, so thanks uh, to all of you for what you've done. And thanks, uh, folks, for coming out to hear this uh, stuff tonight.